welcome. I'm Will, and I'm Alicia. This is Enter the Rabbit Hole. Each week, we dive into and dissect the weird, the momentous, and the downright interesting. And today, we're covering feral children. But before we get to that, I'd like to tell you that if you're listening, please go ahead and follow the show. Leave us a review. Good, bad, or ugly. We'd love to hear from you, and if you have any ideas for future episodes, please share them with us. You can find us on etrhthepod at gmail.com or at etrhthepod on social medias, except Facebook. Yeah, except Facebook, for for just now anyway. So Alicia, how are you doing today? I'm alright. Feral children, the topic we're about to cover, is quite a sad topic. It really is, and we have been... First up, this is going to be a two-parter, so just a heads up on that one. We have really been wading through this for the past week, two weeks, and there are some very interesting stories in here that we think people are really going to be able to get their teeth into, and then there are other stories that we will give you a heads up in advance are are going to be pretty difficult to listen to, aren't they? Yeah, it's also hard because... Usually we do this research before we go to work, so we learn about, like, uh, abused or abandoned children, and then we go to work where we work with small children. Yeah. And it's kind of, uh, it's a bit jarring and a bit, I don't know, uh, draining. Definitely. To be thinking about those things outside of work and then have to go in and deal with kids is... Yeah, it's been a lot. And on top of that, if you could detect a small difference in the sound of my voice today, that's because I have my own little sinus infection. Uh, So I'm now, I'm on the drugs. I'm back on the drugs. It's a shame. We've called an intervention. Yeah. I had to go to the doctor and get put on some amoxicillin to get rid of the stabbing pain in the back of my eye, which was waking me up in the middle of the night because my sinuses were so blocked. It was really just me trying to murder him. Oh. Oh, that's what that was. Hmm. Oh, well. Okay. Uh, I don't don't need the antibiotics anymore. Yeah, I'm good. So, let's dive into today's topic. As we said at the top of the show, we're going to be talking about feral children, also sometimes called wild children. These are children who, either through accident or deliberate isolation, have grown up with limited human contact. Such children have been seen as inhabiting a boundary zone between being human and animal. And for this reason, the motif of the child reared by animals is a recurring theme in myth and folklore. And this is according to uh, Encyclopedia Britannica. Mm Mm-hmm. One of the main sources that we've been using for this episode is Savage Girls and Wild Boys, A History of Savage Children by Michael Newton. It covers the subject in depth in a sensitive and highly readable way. Uh, We definitely recommend that you check it out, right? How, How did you enjoy the book when you read it? Yeah, I thought it was easy to read, actually. A lot of times you you read um, these histories or kind of fact-heavy books, and they can be kind of a slog to get through. I I would say Cannibalism, a perfectly natural history, was easier to read, um, but I still thought this was a pretty good book. Yeah, for those who haven't already, definitely go back and check out our two-parter in Cannibalism. Yeah, I think Michael Newton was highly sensitive to some of the things that we're going to be touching on through this series, which is this sensationalization or the joy that's taken from the shock value surrounding feral children that that we still see to this day. And so I think he's quite careful not to fall into any of those traps. Yeah, so why don't we start with kind of the myth and folklore surrounding feral children? Because for a millennia, people have this kind of fascination with the cross-section of humanity and animalism. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's definitely something that still to this day captures the, the human imagination. And I think it's one of the the things that we're going to have to dispel as we go through this series is the notion that these... An- that I, I almost did it right there, that these children just through being raised outside of human contact, then become purely animalistic. So one of the more well-known myths uh, 
including feral children, is probably the story of Romulus and Remus, who were the founders of Rome, the supposed founders of Rome. Uh, So these were two children, two babies who were left to die of exposure on the riverbank, but were saved by a she-wolf. They were later on saved by a shepherd and his wife, and and raised by the shepherd. Greco-Roman myths are full of the helpful animal trope, um, an animal that raises a young child left to die on the mountain. So this is something that Romans did to children and, and Greeks. They would, if there was a sickly child or a female child that was unwanted, they would often leave them out in the wilderness to die of exposure. So according to Michael Newton, the moment that Romulus and Remus suckle from the she-wolf is a second birth, where death is expected, succor is given, and the children are miraculously born into the order of nature. Nature's mercy admonishes humanity's unnatural cruelty. Only a miracle of kindness can restore the imbalance created by human inequity. So it's kind of this juxtaposition of civilization as the cruel one and nature as uh this nourishing mother yeah and what we see from these examples as well is that rather than the effect of nature corrupting these children or destroying these children their personality and their humanity it almost adds this additional layer of strength to their character. Like, who else could be powerful enough to establish an entire city and then an entire empire apart from a child who has been ostensibly raised by by a she-wolf or nurtured by a she-wolf? Yeah, it gives them, like, an innocence, but also an edge. Mm-hmm. That's so, a good way of putting it. I wanted to quickly go through... There are so many Greco-Roman myths where this happens. So. I'm going to go through them quickly. There's Atlanta, who was abandoned by a father who wanted a son, and she's saved by a she-bear. Aeolus and Beotus, sons of Melanopi, who were exposed by King Desmotus, but were suckled by a cow. Similar- similarly, uh, Telphus, the son of Hercules, was suckled by a deer. Havis, king of Tartessos, was exposed five times by his grandfather, each time in a different wild place, including the ocean but each time he was rescued by animals and breastfed by them, pigs, deer, etc. Uh, Asepolis was suckled by a goat while, the sh- while a sheepdog supervised. That was an important note that I found. Uh, King Heron II, Pendar, a Greek poet, and Miletius were all nursed by bees. I just want to backtrack a little bit to Habis, king of Tartessos. Mm-hmm. And ha- how many times you got to get fooled by your granddad? Like, well, I mean, when you're a baby, are you really getting fooled? Okay, he's a baby in this scenario. Yeah, they they ex- he's suckling on like animals to get milk, and he's being like exposed. But basically, he's a child, a baby or a child who is constantly being brought back I'm, and I'm then left out again. I'm picturing like a small boy, you know, wearing like his you know like his shorts, and his granddad keeps coming along, and he's like. Okay, Habis, let's go for a walk. And he's like, no, Grandpa, last time you left me on a mountain. He's like, no, 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 that, not this time, though. No, no. We're not going to the mountains this time. I thought a nice seaside walk would do us well. I found uh, a series of deep caves that I thought would be really fun to go jumping into. What do you, what do you say? Let's go, let's go. Why don't you go first? Yeah, lots of fun today. Jump! Um, okay, if he's a baby, I have slightly more sympathy for him. Oh, good. Well. (laughs) He gets my seal of approval. It's okay, then. Officially not a dum-dum. I mean, babies are dum-dums. That's kind of their whole thing. They are. Uh, so there's another interesting myth about, um, I don't know if it's Jangar or Yangar. He's a hero of a Mongolian epic poem. He was left in a cave after his homeland was invaded. Yangar went outside and roared, and all the animals living nearby came to see what the noise was. He befriended them, and they fed him and taught him their skills. She wolves suckled him. A deer brought him fruit. He learned to roar from a tiger, although it sounds like he could already roar, uh, to hunt from an eagle and to run from an antelope. Yangar lived in the wild for two years. He then murders the invaders and becomes Khan, all at the ripe old age of three. 
Hmm, so like a proper Mongolian boy's tale of adventure. I like that he's got kind of like a male Disney princess thing yeah. going on, where instead of like going into the woods and singing, he walks out into the desert and like, Rah! and then all these animals come like, you know, bounding out of the bush to like give him things. Yeah, I think like Snow White, but... Uh... Hench. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, ripped. Mm-hmm. I like to think that like, you know... The, the tigers all have, like, this big eyes as well, like, sparkling and, like... Yes, yeah. They're, they're all... helping with the laundry with their teeth. Yeah, they all look like little anime creatures. They all look like Pokemon. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, this mythology of the animal rearing the child also seems to be a reoccurring theme in many native North American legends, but I don't have great sources for that. A lot of my sources, so I, I had a starting off point of this essay written in like the 70s where they're still referring to Native Americans as Indians. So I was really confused for a while when they were talking about like Indians, but then the names were very clearly not like from India. Yeah, although this is a tangent. Some scholars who to this day when they're writing about Native Americans will still refer to them as Indians, not because they're racist or they're not woke, but they they identify at the top of their uh, academic paper that that's the the term that they're going to be using for native peoples of the uh, North and South Americas. I think, I can't remember the name of the book now, I'm pretty sure it's called something like 1405, and it talks about life in pre-Columbus America, and throughout that entire book, the author refers to uh, Native Americans as Indians, and that was only written, I think, in like the mid noughties But even he says at the top of the book, um, you know, I'm not doing this to be offensive. Okay, I guess. Um, I just I find it a bit ironic that he's like referring to times before Columbus came and named them Indians. <laughs> yeah, and he still calls them like Indians. He's Sh like, but I'm not being offensive. Sure. Yeah, I think he he probably explains it a lot. A lot better than than I do. I'm not trying to be an apologist here, uh, by by any means. Um, like I don't know uh, what name people prefer, but I prefer the name Native people or Native like Native Americans. I just to, it's like calling you. I don't know. Like yes, I don't know. I'm trying to think of like a, a slur for Scottish people. What if I called you English? Like, oh, no, I would not care for that Yeah, at all. like something that you aren't. Yeah, fair enough. And I do find it slightly troublesome when, look, some of the curriculum that we use aren't, shall we say, completely up to date. Some of them are uh, in-house or homemade. And so when you're going through the alphabet with young children, it's like, hey, He's it's talking for about Apple. at work, not our particular, like, no, study materials. No, when, when we're teaching uh, as ESL teachers, and we're going through materials that have things like A is for apple, B is for ball, and then you get to I, and it's like, I is for Indian, and it's a child, it's clearly meant to be a Native American child wearing a headdress uh, <laughs> and moccasins. I, I find that problematic. Yeah, at our last job, they they tried to make us sing Ten Little Indians. Yeah. And, um... I mean, Ten Little Dinosaurs is right there. Yeah, why not just Ten... I, I just sang Ten Little Dinosaurs. I was like, w we're still learning the numbers, and it's fine. Like, the kids don't know what a Native American is anyway, and they're not going to understand when I explain it to them, because they're three, and they can't even, like, sit still without pooping their pants, so... Literally, it's not a joke. Anyway, anyway. <laughs> let's go back to um some other... Dirty children? No. No, um, no. No, no, no. Some other uh, stories of feral children. So let's talk a little bit about the tropes surrounding feral children stories, because we've run through a number of these stories, and there seem to be common themes that pop up every time. So feral child stories have been around as long as children have and continue to persist into the modern era. They are different in many ways, but according to Guardian science writer Mary Ann Ochata, in a 2017 article, there are four key tropes that recur in many of these stories. The first one is that feral children make the sound of an animal. According to Ochata, it's not surprising that children will pick up on and mimic the sounds of animals that are living they're living with. After all, 
Children will mimic the sounds of those around them and seek company and comfort from whatever source is available. But she's quick to point out that this doesn't mean that the children are talking in dog or chicken language. Rather, it could be seen as the disordered or pre-verbal vocalizations of a profoundly damaged child. That's one of the first things that people jump to, right? When they think about a feral child, they're like, oh, well, they can talk to the animals. They, they are raised by monkeys, so they can talk to the monkeys. Yeah, again, these aren't little Disney princes and princesses. When you're hearing the noises that they're producing, it's more likely that what they're doing is a kind of mimicry. They're just parroting the sounds that they've become accustomed to. Um, and in some cases, they might not even be producing the necessarily the sounds of the animals that they were living with. Again, we'll we'll get into this in depth, but you know, you're talking about the the output of a mind that has never learned to take in a language fully. It's never developed its own language. Uh, so the second trope that she comes up against is that the feral child is covered in hair. This is sometimes known as hypertrichosis, which is an extremely rare hormonal condition. Allow malnutrition and dietary changes that can cause excess body hair growth in some instances. It is not, as Ochata points out, something that you typically see in famine-hit or war-torn countries. What is more likely happening is that an outsider uh, is seeing a child with long, unwashed, unkempt hair and then adding their own twist. As she puts it, add fear and a storyteller's eye for freak show detail and you end up with fur. Yeah, I mean, there are a series of photographs um, that are in the episode description basically like trying to recreate feral children they all have like super long kind of gritty hair and sure if you spend any time like outside of quote-unquote civilization you don't get a haircut your hair is like matted and probably quite thick like especially like you know the way children's hair is mm -hmm. where it always just seems to like go out you know yeah. and get like really big um and they probably also haven't had a like a bath in a long time, so there there's dirt on their skin, which might make it look like they have hair. I mean, think about what it's like if you have spent a weekend camping. You come back in to your house, you go into the shower, and the amount of dirt that comes off of you, and you've not been living for years in the bush. You've literally been like on a campsite in a field somewhere, and yet you're still pretty grotty. Um, yeah. As Alicia was alluding to earlier uh, as well, if we haven't mentioned it already, all of the sources and pictures for today's episode are going to be in the episode description as well. So the third thing that Ochata points out is that they have claw-like nails, sharp teeth, and staring eyes. Ochata explains that children who have grown up away from other people won't have social cues such as avoiding staring. This makes sense. Consider the stereotype of villagers in a tiny fishing town or hillside hamlet that seldom receives visitors, all staring eyes and awkward pauses. Also, she says, long finger and toenails aren't a surprising thing if you have had no one to cut them, but in the context of feral child story, they become claws. Sure, it's a dehumanization. Mm-hmm, yeah. Um, also, I think it's something that Michael Newton talks about in his book. He meets one of the feral children that we'll talk briefly about later, uh, John Sabunya. Mm -hmm. And he says that Sabunya is just kind of staring at him. And to the extent that he's, he's, he says that he's the one who feels embarrassed, he's the one who feels like an outsider. And saying that it feels like John should feel like an outsider, but instead, the way that John is staring at him uh, kind of, like, turns the tide. Yeah. Again, because we're, especially if you come from a place like the UK or the US, staring at somebody and making prolonged eye contact is actually quite an antagonistic thing. You would actively avoid doing it uh, on the street because you, you don't want to end up having a confrontation with somebody. Yeah, but it's it's not necessarily the way it is all around the world. We should know that being people who who are very widely traveled, <laughs> I think you'll yes. find. Um, but as people who who have lived in a place like China, where we can be the first like foreigners that people have ever seen in their lives, 
people gave us, like, their babies to hold to take pictures with and would just, like, spend time staring at us. Yeah, lots of staring, lots of just within your eye line taking out their phones and taking pictures of you, which, you know, we would consider to be incredibly rude and we would be like, hey, you know, like, what what are you looking at? What, what's your problem? But We chose to move to a place that wasn't Shanghai or Beijing. It was yeah. a place that was, like... Oh, it was a big city, but there were very few foreigners. So, you know, what can we really expect? Exactly. And if it is somebody's first experience of seeing a foreigner, or it's something that they seldom encounter, then, and if they don't have the same social cues that, that we do, if they have a different sense of what is or is not polite, then of course they're going to act differently. Um, so yeah, we, we've experienced a little bit of that firsthand. And so the fourth trope that Ochata talks about is the idea that the feral child can't eat cooked food. Cooking our food is one of the things that separates us from the animals. But as Ochata points out, a distressed child in a foreign environment will likely refuse all food, cooked or otherwise. Sure, you eat when you feel safe. Yeah. You know, anybody who has like dealt with maybe an abused animal or like has felt like really stressed and you feel like you just can't eat because you have like a pit in your stomach. Just imagine like you haven't seen other humans, even if it's not very long, say it's been like a month or two and you're a small child and people capture you. These are like, that's the verb that they use in most of the stories. Mm -hmm. uh, they capture these feral children. So it's probably not like a pleasant process. How stressed and upset would you be? And then people are trying to like give you food. You know, you don't know who these people are. You don't know what it is they're giving you. Of course you wouldn't eat it. Also, the idea of what does or does not appear to be appetizing is kind of another learned behavior. Consider, you know, what we would think of on uh, an American menu or a European menu, things that we would think of as looking like really delectable. And then you look at offerings from other parts of the world and, and we might be consider we might consider them to look kind of disgusting, kind of off-putting, and yet those are delicacies in those parts of the world. So again, this is just a learned behavior that is potentially not being picked up on. It's not necessarily that these kids can only subsist on raw meat and they have to eat things that they kill or, or that they scavenge for. It's just, I mean, you know, maybe they, they just aren't in a place to eat. So, if we recognize these tropes for what they are, a way to sensationalize the story of an abused or abandoned child, rather than a medical checklist designed to determine a prognosis, then we can avoid further stigmatization of children that are already put under an amazing amount of public scrutiny. Yeah, I think it's very important in our episode for us that we aren't trying to sensationalize feral children. We're trying to recognize and, I guess, share with you that these are very traumatized children that have gone through a lot. Yeah. And it's important that we see them for what they are as children and not try to put like these kind of animalistic labels on them. Yeah, although of course we are going to be covering some of the the slightly wilder or zanier stories of feral children as well. So, stay tuned. Okay, so I wanted to start with Peter the Wild Boy, uh, because if you've heard of feral children, you might have heard this story, especially if you're from the UK. So if you go up the King's Grand Staircase at Kensington Palace in London, you might see a 1720s portrait of a young boy by William Kent. This boy has a cheerful smile and is pictured holding a bunch of acorns. The only clue about his past is a feral child before he became a pet at the courts of George I and II. So he was found alone and naked in a German forest in 1725. At about age 12, they're not really sure, uh, a year after he was discovered, he was brought by George I to court. So this child is found in the woods. They don't know anything about him. Uh, he's naked and he can't speak. And he's in Germany but he's brought to the court in <laughs> England for some reason. Which I'm assuming has something to do with the... the Hanovers? Yeah, the House of Hanover and the royal lineage descending from German aristocrats. Yeah. So I think 
he he's brought to the king's court as a novelty, right? Yeah. So he he basically becomes kind of like this little pet. Like they dress him up in a little green suit, which he hated wearing. He would always try and take it off. Um, and at night he would curl up on the floor rather than this like big grand canopy bed he was given. He was supposedly terrified when he first saw a man taking off stockings, believing he was peeling off his skin. And the court was horrified by his lack of manners. Which, surprise, <laughs> a child that you found in the woods doesn't know your courtly manners. Yeah, and so my understanding is that he's eventually given up by the king. And I, I love this notion of King George being like, oh, yes, very good. Mm, yes, the little wild boy, look at him. Oh, look at his scabber around like a little monkey. Oh, no, he defecated again. It's disgusting. Get him away. No, I don't want a wild boy anymore. No, give him. I don't care. Get him out of here. I know I said I wanted him, but I don't want him anymore. Just to bring, bring me a... Bring bring me a monkey. I want a monkey now. But a trained monkey. Yes, put a monkey in man's clothes. I want a reverse wild boy. Okay, well, uh, so he w they tried to teach him to speak, but he never did learn to speak. And here is an account of his first time at court. The wild boy played with a glove of Caroline's, the Princess of Wales, grew fascinated by a pocket watch that struck the hours, and, as was usual with him, attempted some mild pickpocketing. Furthermore, rumours spread that he had, in breach of all civilised decorum, seized the Lord Chamberlain's staff and put his hat on before the king. What in the world was he doing? Everyone knows you do not touch the Lord Chamberlain's staff. <gasps> That's his staff. I can't even imagine! Um... And again, so the reason that this is coming from Princess Caroline is because this was after the king had kind of become bored or disgusted with Peter the Wild Boy and so kind of just gifted him to her, right? Uh, I don't know about that, I because both the king and Princess Caroline are there in mm. the story. So the king does later become, the whole court becomes kind of disenchanted with having a um, poor traumatized child. Uh, at court, and so he's retired to a farm in Hertfordshire. Hertfordshire? I think we're going to say Hertfordshire, yeah. Hertfordshire. Uh, where the farmers became quite fond of them. Uh, he had a tendency to wander, and so the farmers made him a collar with the inscription, Peter, the wild man of Hanover, whoever will bring him to Mr. Fenn at Burkhamstead shall be paid for their trouble. So basically, Peter would wander and sometimes be found like counties away and so they made him like a collar that he could not remove and in in their minds like this is a kindness because like it, it's done out of out of kindness because if he wanders away they can't take care of him i guess in their mind the other alternative is just keep him keeping him caged up or isolated yeah so he he's given like enough money to survive but he he again he never learns to speak but he does have this kind of friendly relationship with the farmers near this farm that he's retired on and at the time he was the center of this debate on nature versus nurture and some people even wondered if he had a soul because he couldn't speak now everybody knows that if you're mute no soul yes those are the rules if you're mute or if automatic doors in a supermarket won't open for you, then you have no soul. Also, or if you're ginger. Yeah, I was going to say that one. Uh, yeah. Ginger. So like me, when I die, just nothing happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, he explodes into a cloud of dust because he's a demon. Yeah, that's just when I go out into sunlight, direct sunlight. That's true. Um, yeah, there was this big discussion around about the time, I think, that during this period of enlightenment where they were trying to work out what is consciousness? Is there such a thing as the human soul? How can you quantify the human soul? Yeah, and and Peter is kind of at the center of this debate because look at him, he's like a little animal, but he's a person. And, you know, so does he have a soul? It's just, I, I, I mean, on the one hand, it's a kindness that I guess that he's found by King George because can you imagine what would have happened to this little boy in the 1700s? As I'll get to in a minute, the it 
who he is is probably the reason why he was abandoned in the first place. Nobody has the capacity to take care of this poor child. There are no, like, even if there are, there are asylums, but you definitely don't want to go to an asylum, right? No, they are just holes to throw crazy people into until they die. Well, not even crazy people, just people you don't want to take care of anymore. Yeah, or women who want to vote. Yes. Oh, God. Horrific. Um, so a new analysis of the portrait that I talked about at the top uh, suggests that Peter had a rare genetic condition known as Pitt-Hopkins syndrome. This is supposedly indicated by his short stature, his very lustrous mop of thick curly hair. He has these kind of hooded eyelids. He has a very, like, Cupid's bow mouth with a pronounced curve to the upper lip. So if you look at this portrait of him, like, the way that he's smiling, the way that they've drawn his lip is, like, very tall and very, like, curved. Almost kind of, like, feline. Yeah. He disliked clothes, but was wrestled daily into a green suit. And he, he had fused fingers, which might have been a poorly healed injury, or might have been clubbed fingers. Yeah, I think Michael Newton compares them to almost like a duck's foot, if you think of the, the webbing on a duck's mm. feet. Um, but yeah, at the time I think it was ascribed to he had had some kind of wound on his hand which had caused them to heal weirdly. Yeah, so Pitt Hopkins, this genetic condition, was only identified in 1978, and it has severe neurological effects, according to Professor Beals uh, in this Guardian article, I believe. It's a severe learning uh, difficulty. It creates developmental difficulties and the inability to develop speech. So, according to her, no matter how hard they would have tried to teach him English, he wouldn't have been able to learn because this disease created an inability to develop certain parts of his brain. Mm -hmm. And there's some there's some weight to that. Certainly, Peter the Wild Boy wouldn't be the only feral or wild child who could fit with a classification of having some kind of neurological disorder or potentially being somewhere in the spectrum. Actually, there are academics in the field of study surrounding feral children who have hy hypothesized that basically all stories of feral children boil down to children with additional support needs who have been abandoned in the wild. And so what we perceive as being animalistic tendencies that have come about as years of being raised in amongst animals are actually more akin to, uh, you know, mental disorders that might have led them to be abandoned in the first place. There is some debate. I think the, the notion that there are no such thing as feral children, no, no animal, uh, no children who have been raised by animals has been debunked. But at one point that was uh, in academic circles considered to be like a, a real or, or tangible theory. Yeah, I mean, you can certainly see it with some of these older cases, these uh, like idea of this child was so strange and different. And you look at some of the characteristics they're talking about and you're like, well, maybe that kid had autism and you just didn't know what autism was. That's also a, a theory about um, changelings, you know, the the stories about fairies who come and steal children and then replace them with fairy child like fairy children mm -hmm. and you don't notice until the child starts to grow up and they start like acting out and they're they're evil but really it could be that these children are children who have like children who might be on the spectrum or have another like mental uh difficulty and are acting out because they d they can't figure out how to behave, quote-unquote, correctly. Yeah. Um, and so people just immediately assume, well, they're evil. Mm -hmm. Or they're mm -hmm. changed by fairies. Yeah. That's my go-to. Anytime that I think one of my friends uh, or a family member is acting strange, I'm like, the fairies. The fairies got to you. Who got to you? Which fairy? Is it Tinkerbell? Tell me right now. I just assume they're really ginger, but they dye their hair. Okay. Um, well... <laughs> Shots fired. Uh, on that note, should we take a quick break? Yeah, let's take a break. And 
welcome back. Hello again. Uh, so we've just been talking about Peter the Wild Boy. Let's talk about another similar story, uh, this time from France. We're going to talk about Victor of Aveyron. A disgusting, slovenly boy affected with spasmodic and frequently convulsing motions, continually balancing himself like some of the animals in the menagerie, biting and scratching those who contradicted him, expressing no kind of affection for those who attended upon him, and, in short, indifferent to everybody, and paying no regard to anything. These were the impressions of French physician Jean-Marc Gaspard Itard. Oh, uh, what an accent. Thank you. Referring to a boy with no name, a boy discovered in the woods of Caen, France in 1800, who would later be given the name Victor. Victor was thought to be around 11 or 12 years old. He apparently subsisted on a diet of acorns, chestnuts, and roots. According to writer Christina Dulcher, his body was graffitied with scars from abrasions and animal bites. A prevailing school of thought during this period of Western Enlightenment was the notion of the noble savage. This idea essentially says that humankind in its current form is corrupt, and although the people of the wilderness were in many ways backward compared to the cosmopolitan masses, they possessed the kind of spiritual purity that we have lost. Victor was to challenge this idea. So I think we've come across this term before. Again, we were talking about Native Americans earlier. And people who were against the expansion of the American West and moving around indigenous peoples and putting them on reservations, even by by the standards of the time, they would have been considered quite woke. But even them, uh, even they thought of the indigenous peoples as being inherently less than. Yeah, they're less than, but they're in tune with nature. Look at them. Viewing, like, a person in terms of an animal, basically. And I think it's one of the reasons... So, a lot of our examples today are from Europe. And I think it's important to touch on this because there are examples of children in other places. One, those sources are difficult to find. Um, Two, I don't want to fall into a trap of, like, children from another place becoming like savage to us like uh especially in somewhere like india or i don't know like south america like a conquered area and thinking of well the children's gone back to the wild and now they're like native and animalistic you know uh, i think that's a, a a difficult but easy trap like to fall into you know definitely and we're not just talking about children being savage because they don't bathe a certain number of times per week or children being savage because they eat with their hands or any anything else that could be considered almost like a cultural difference. We're talking about children who have never had the capacity to learn a language or do not ha- know how to interact with people full stop, regardless of what part of the world those people hail from. Um, so Victor is an example of this. After being found roaming the woods, Victor was taken in. The people who initially observed Victor after discovering that the boy was mute and unable to communicate labelled him an idiot. However, one physician, Jean-Marc Gaspard de Tald, took over the boy's care and was determined to see what progress could be made with him. Well, I think it's important to note that idiot at this time period probably would have meant mute or, or deaf, right? I think that's the original connotation of the of the word idiot so to call somebody an idiot isn't somebody who like puts all of their money on some obscure cryptocurrency because they think it's going to be the next big thing and then immediately lose it an idiot is somebody who could be deaf or dumb for example so over the course of two years Ital'd sought to train victor mit associate professor of brain and cognitive sciences rebecca sachs described the process to educate him. She wrote, Using a combination of food rewards and physical punishments, Ital'd forced Victor through set after set of newly devised linguistic exercises. Eventually, Victor did learn some basic signs, but critically, he never learned to speak. I think this is really interesting. The way that she describes this is almost like the way that you would train a dog. Yeah. Again, probably considered to be quite progressive at the time. 
I don't know. If you were trying to rehabilitate a child nowadays that you had found under compromising circumstances, you probably wouldn't be administering physical punishments. Yeah, and in the next episode, we'll talk a lot about uh, linguistics and how your brain needs communication. Um, and at what point can you are you no longer able to learn a language? Mm -hmm. And I think that might be the case for Victor. Um, how old was he when he was found? 11 or 12. Yeah, so he's already entered like puberty. And a lot of people say that after puberty, if you have not learned a language, if you've been isolated, or um, there isn't like, you haven't been given the chance, basically, then you are no longer able, you've lost it. You can't learn a language. Yeah. Uh, so Victor stopped progressing eventually, and Ital became uh, eventually frustrated with him, and he just gave up on the work entirely in 1806. The boy was transferred into the care of Madame Guerin, I believe is how you say it. Uh, he lived with her in anonymity until his death in 1828. So there's, a, there's an ongoing trend here, I think, with children being passed around different individuals they're inevitably given over to some kind of doctor or academic the doctor or academic goes in with a viewpoint that they can fully rehabilitate this child and make them a fully functioning member of society it doesn't work everybody gets frustrated uh, i imagine it is not much fun at all for the child in question and then they're eventually just kind of housed they're just boxed somewhere until until they die. Yeah, and unfortunately, we see this with uh, much more recent cases as well, and some of the cases that we'll cover later. Um, a lot of these children are just kind of failed by uh, the system around them. They're passed from person to person, or from foster home to foster home, because nobody has any idea with, about how to deal with this child, how to help this child, and what they really need. Yeah, and an unfortunate side effect of that, regardless of how good the care is they receive in any one place, one thing that children need is consistency. So this chopping and changing of caregivers in of itself can be damaging to their further development. So on that note, I'd like to go into a much more modern case. Uh, the case of Oksana Malaya, I believe is how you pronounce her name. So in 1994, an eight-year-old girl in Ukraine was found with a pack of wild dogs barking and running on all fours. A three-year-old Oksana Malaya appears to have been neglected or abandoned by her supposed alcoholic parents. In some reports, she crawled into a kennel for warmth and was integrated into the pack of dogs. She spent five years with a feral dog, reportedly even entering her old house to scrounge for scraps. What, uh... Already such a bleak image that that conjures. Mm -hmm. A uh, a post-Soviet landscape um, and a, a small child just running around with a pack of wild dogs. Yeah, I'd be interested to know how many of these cases are the result of some kind of political turmoil, some kind of political upheaval that then leads to families moving around or any kind of social safety net being removed. Yeah, I mean, it does seem to me, like, how can she still be in the same area? She's a small child. She's very, like, recognizable. A, a, a human with a pack of dogs. How are people not reporting this? We had this conversation when we were, like, getting ready for this episode, and I was just so frustrated by the fact that neighbors could possibly see a child running around with dogs, and it's, like obvious that this child needs help and yet nobody helps her yeah and i think i came out in the the camp that says that that kind of behavior is not okay if you if you see something you should say something but that people tend to mind their own business right and if you don't want to if you don't want to draw negative attention to yourself then even if you see something problematic you might end up just saying nothing at all. So, not okay, but I don't know. Maybe in their mind they had their own reasons for not noticing a girl running running around the streets, running around the, the woods with a pack of dogs. I guess. Um, so, 
when she was eventually quote-unquote captured, she was given to the state, and she bounced around psychiatric hospitals and group homes. In 2006, a British child psychologist named Lynn Fry came with Channel 4 to evaluate Oksana. So I'm focusing on this particular evaluation because I'm sure there were some done in, uh, in Ukraine and by non-English speaking, um, psychiatrists, but this is the one we have access to. Um, it is part of a television program, so Lynn Fry herself says that it's not exactly the most, like, academic or, or strict of studies. And always, if you do have your own information taken from separate sources that we haven't covered, please do get in touch. We're on etrhthepod at gmail.com, and you can find us on social media at etrhthepod as well. Okay, so she gave Oksana uh, something called the Weschler test, uh, which is an intelligence test similar to uh, the IQ test. The Weschler scale assigns an intelligence age to a person based on how well they do at certain tasks like drawing or simple math. She was 23 when I saw her, says Fry, and according to the Weschler test, she could draw at the level of a five or six year old. So to, to us, that's quite shocking that she's 23 and she's drawing at the age of a five year old. But to Fry, she was quite impressed because she didn't think that she was going to be able to, like, draw at all, basically. That she wouldn't be able to have the intelligence of a five-year-old. Uh, just hopping off the subject for a second, so presumably the Weschler test or the Weschler scale is named for some kind of scientist named Weschler. If you were to have a, a scale named after you, what would it measure? You can just come out of the blue like that <laughs> i mean i did i am and i don't know maybe um stress levels or anxiety maybe uh laid backedness because i'm a fairly laid back person but also stressed and anxious at the same time it's a very weird combination i know i'm like a chihuahua about to explode so like the palmer scale would measure like if somebody is just sat in a reclining chair but but their house is just like covered in piles of things that need to be like shifted. If they've if they've got like stacks of like homework in front <laughs> in front of them, they would get like the, oh god, they're like she's a ten on the Palmer okay, scale. Okay, I'd like to note that there are not piles of things all over the apartment. Um, and no, that not I don't at have all, piles. because you're <laughs> not a ten on the Palmer scale. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I like where this is going. I feel like the Grant scale would measure how frequently you make uh, dad jokes oh, or make sure, great. inappropriate jokes that make other people feel uncomfortable. Or just make your girlfriend ro roll her eyes and leave the room. I would be a 10 on the Grant scale. just feel attacked right now. I don't know if I can go on with the podcast. So, um, Fry asked Oksana to do things like put the toy ducks behind the cow, and she was able to understand prepositions and follow directions. She could also recognize herself in a mirror, and when Fry asked her to look in the mirror and asked her if that was her, um, Oksana Malaya was a bit confused. She was like, well, yeah, of course, why would you even ask? But I think most people know that looking in the mirror and recognizing yourself is like a sentience test. And pretty much humans and primates are some of the only ones that can pass the sentience test. Uh, elephants as well can mm -hmm. look in the mirror and recognize themselves. But that's the reason why if you put like a cat or a bird in front of a mirror, they will attack the mirror. Yeah, and I think this is also a good uh, indicator for any potential hoaxes out there and stories of feral children when you hear things like, uh, the child looked in the mirror and they thought they were looking at another child and they said, who is that? It's like, did, did they really? Come on, because even, even your dog can recognize, like, it's him when they look in the mirror. Uh, or stories of, like, children touching fire because they don't know what it is. Again, uh, feels like a bit of a stretch. I don't know. I, my dog could definitely not recognize it was her in the mirror, so I don't know about that. <laughs> Um, okay, so today Malaya lives at an adult therapeutic community in a farm in Odessa, Ukraine, where she milks cows and helps with daily chores. Developmentally, Fry says Malaya has the cognitive ability of a five or six year old, and she doesn't see her progressing much farther. I mean, this is probably probably a best case scenario here, right? You 
these children are fascinating to us because they represent the forbidden experiment, right? And I know we're going to talk about this more in the next episode, but studying a child who has been completely removed from humanity for a prolonged period of time and then reintroduced. And so I guess the temptation here is just to continue exposing her to more and more studies, more and more experiments. But when when does that when does that just become cruel? When does that stop generating anything of any kind of value for either the child in question or in this case the woman in question and the researchers? Yeah, and I think uh, we often get lost in like, well, what does the what does the researcher say about her? Like, what what are, tests are they doing on her? Like, is this really the healthiest thing for that child? You know, what are you doing to help that set that child up for the future? Are you making sure that there is a stable place for them to live and that they're going to be healthy and safe and happy? You know, I think those are the fundamentals. Every time we study one of these cases, it seems like the first place they're shipped off to is like a psychiatric hospital to be under observation. Is that really what they need? Don't don't they need like a a safe space? They've been so clearly in unsafe spaces for so long. Give them safety. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we have one more case today, and that's the case of John Sabunya. I assume that I'm saying his name correctly, but as with all names, uh, I apologize. The best thing that you can do, uh, if we have mispronounced any of the names in this podcast, is at us on social media and just remind us of like uh, just how terrible we are at research and pronunciation and just how terrible we are as human beings uh, because we've mispronounced one of the words. That's, that's the best thing they can do, right? No, I think uh, the best thing you can do is just keep it to yourself. Shut up. (laughs) Thank you. Okay, so um, the best research, sorry, the best resource I could find about John, uh, aside from the Michael Newton book, is an article in El País, which is a Spanish newspaper. So I have translated most of this myself. Uh, I can speak Spanish. I am not fluent. Um, So, you know. Do my best here, guys. Yeah, so when it says that they originally found John uh, under the cheese sandwich, that's... No, that's correct. That is correct. That okay. is correct. Yeah, yeah, I thought so. Okay, so John was born in Uganda and ran into the jungle after witnessing his father murder his mother when he was five years old. So he, he thought that either like he was going to be attacked or he like couldn't deal with the situation. And so he ran away. His father, meanwhile, uh, also ran uh, in order to escape being persecuted for the murder of his wife, uh, and I believe later committed suicide. So, you know, he gets his comeuppance. Sure. Uh, It's a happy story all around. Uh, So, it's believed that he found shelter with a group of vervet monkeys, and he was saved. He was taken in. possibly months or a year later by Paul and Molly Waswa, who ran an orphanage of 1,500 children. They say he had white knees from running on his knees and that he had, uh, like, his... He was riddled with tapeworms. Uh, When I read your notes, I thought that said velvet monkeys, which, I mean, could you imagine? It's an offshoot of the velvet underground, velvet monkeys. I was actually picturing something just like uh, tiny beanie babies that had come to life and not only do they like nurture you and they show you where to get all the best fruit but like they're just so soft and and they're just like continually like crawling all over you um which is the dream yeah um not mine personally but sorry you might be wondering like why is will doing fewer jokes in this episode why are the jokes that will is doing a little bit weirder it's because like his brain is melting and also, uh, yes, I am still running a pretty heavy fever. But also, like, it's kind of hard to make uh, abandoned and abused kids funny, you know? Yeah, um, and, and some would say maybe you shouldn't. Maybe you shouldn't. Okay, well, Douglas Candeland, uh, an American psychologist at the University of Bucknell, wanted to know if the story was true. So he visited John, 
who was able to pick out the vervet monkeys from a book of primates, which surprised him. So the vervet spend a lot of time on the ground and primarily eat fruit, which could, which could have possibly given him enough water to survive. John was then taken to a group of vervet monkeys to, to see what he would do, I guess. He approached them with his eyes down, not looking, not looking in their faces, and opened his hand to show it was empty, and he then began to play with them. According to the scientists Candelan and Debbie Cox, he, he has been among monkeys, for sure. He does not look at them in the face to prevent them from turning against him or fleeing. As for the hand, it shows them that they have nothing to fear. Did I tell you about my monkey encounter in Bali? I mean, you've certainly told me, but I don't think you've told that. The no, people. I was asking the listeners. I know they can't answer. Uh, so in Bali, there's a place known as the Monkey Forest, which you can guess is full of monkeys. And uh, on your way in, you can buy like sweet potatoes and things to feed the monkeys. The place is teeming with them and they are so acclimated to humans that they will just like, they... <laughs> They don't even wait for if, to become familiar with you. Literally, they'll see a person with like a sweet potato in their hand. They'll, they'll run up and grab it, which is great. Um, however, I had some mosquito repellent cream in my backpack, which one of these monkeys thought looked tastier than the sweet potato that I had in my hand. And so proceeded to run up onto my backpack, grab it out of the side pouch, run off, and these smart little bastards opened it up with their tiny monkey hands and then proceeded to just kind of like dip their tiny monkey tongues into the cream. Like, and all I could think was, oh my God, I can't have a monkey's death on my conscience. Like, and on top of everything else I've done, like I can't have killed a monkey. Yeah, on top of all the other genocides. Yes, on top of all the other monkey related violence. So I tried to run up and instinctively, like, grab it out of the monkey's hand. Mistake. <laughs> Don't do that, because something monkeys do is try to bite you. <laughs> and I was pretty close to getting rabies, I think. Like, if it had broken the skin, uh, then then I would have been in deep, deep trouble. I had to wait until it kind of got bored with it, drop it, and then run, grab it, and run off. And these monkeys, like, properly came after me. Um, by which I mean, like, they find my home address and they start threatening my family. And Did you do the whole like Indiana Jones with the sweet potato and the cream? Like... Literally, I was sat there kind of weighing it up, and then and then there was this whole thing with the giant boulder. Um, well, the giant boulder is the monkeys. The monkeys formed a giant ball and came rolling after you. A ball of monkeys. It wasn't as fun as it sounds. Uh, I guess my point is like. You, the, all this uh, behavior that John Sabunya was displaying towards these monkeys, you, I, I guess you would have to show this kind of deference and this lack of antagonism towards them. Otherwise, they, they're they going to be potentially violent or they're going to scatter. Yeah, and the fact that, because he's still quite young at this age, like at this point in the story, so he has obviously spent some time with monkeys whether or not he has lived with them i think that's up for debate like because he knows how to approach them does not mean that they like took him into uh i almost wanted to say herd that's not what it is um a pack of monkeys a squad of monkeys a barrel of monkeys <laughs> Let's go with squad i like it like they're yeah. just rolling up and they're convertible he's taken into the squad <laughs> mm -hmm. they're just hanging out okay so uh after this, John traveled as part of the Pearl of Africa Choir and reportedly has a lovely singing voice. Yeah, I mean, good to know that there is life after this, mm. right? So there is uh, an, another article that I read somewhere where he's asked if he is, uh, like, if he loves the monkeys, if he's grateful, like, to them. And he says something... A rat to the effect of basically he's grateful that like he was able to survive with them in order to be loved by humans mm -hmm. that you know at the end of the day they're animals and they helped him to survive but he doesn't really have the capacity to like love them like family members and i think that's a trope that we kind of get stuck into with yeah. wild or feral children it's this idea that like 
Tarzan style. They they're family members with yeah. these wild animals. That's my monkey mother. That these are my monkey brothers and sisters. It's like you you can view them as caregivers, but uh, not necessarily. You're not necessarily looking at them in the same way that you're looking at other humans and the relationships that you form with other humans. Um, this would be a terrific time for a break. I think so. Yeah, let's take a little break. And welcome back. Hi again. Um, so we've been talking about some of the tropes surrounding feral children, and we've given you some of what we think are real examples of feral children. And when we talk about real examples of feral children, we're talking about children who either A, there's strong evidence to suggest that they have spent some time amongst animals, and that has had some kind of effect on their behavior and their development at a young age, or B, children who have been raised uh, or spent time separate for, from society at a young age, and again, that's had a potential effect on, on the way that they have grown. Let's talk about some hoaxes. So Ooh. clearly, the general public throughout the ages have had a deep and sometimes macabre fascination with feral children. For the Us? No. <laughs> That's why you're listening to this podcast. <laughs> you disgust us. Yeah, please don't stop listening. For the unscrupulous, this creates an opportunity to garner wealth and an albeit slightly warped kind of fame. French surgeon and author Serge Arroz, I think, conducted an exhaustive study of stories of feral children as far back as 1304 through to 1954. His book entitled Le Nigue des Enfants Lus was, or the mystery of the wolf children, uh, was written over the course. Obviously. <laughs> obviously, you knew that. Was written over the course of four years, and it argues that only one documented case is authentic that of uh, Marie Angelique Meme Leblanc. All the rest, he argues, are either undocumented, mistaken, or out and out hoaxes. One such case was that of the two Indian girls, Amala and Kamala. Had you heard of Amala and Kamala before we started doing this? No, not before we started researching. They they did come up in the research a couple times. Yeah, and again, we, we've we tried to be really diligent in our research and our sources, but if you do a Google search of feral children, it's really difficult to get away from the very buzzfeedy, clickbaity. These ten children you won't believe spent time in the wilderness, raised by monkeys, raised by pigs. Yeah, seventeen children you'll never believe were raised by animals. And it's like, well, you know, I mean, I, I could. Don't assume these things. I'm a very smart person, okay? Uh, well, anyway, like, if you look on any of those sources, the name Amala and Kamala will probably pop up pretty quickly. The girls aged 18 months and 8 years old respectively were discovered and rescued from a wolf's den in October of 1920 in the district of Midnapur, west of Calcutta. Their rescuer and the man who would display them for all the world to see was the rector of a local orphanage, a man named Joseph Amrito Lal Singh. Singh was supposedly helped in trying to rehabilitate the girls after their return from the wild, and kept a detailed diary over the course of ten years, outlining all of his observations. Singh claimed that, quote, The two girls showed wolf-like behaviour, typical for feral children. They would not allow themselves to be dressed, scratched and bit people who tried to feed them, rejected cooked foods, and walked on all fours. Both girls have developed thick calluses on their palms and knees from having walked on all fours. The girls were mostly nocturnal, had an aversion to sunshine, and could see very well in the dark. They also exhibited an acute sense of smell and an enhanced ability to hear. The girls enjoyed the taste of raw meat and would eat out of a bowl on the ground. They seemed to be insensitive to cold and heat, 
and appeared to show no human emotions of any kind apart from fear. At night, they would howl like wolves, calling out to their family. They did not speak. What well, do you think of all that? It sounds really plausible. Yeah I'm, yeah, I'm on board. 100%. Take my money. There is this, again, this trope that occurs throughout the stories of feral children that they've somehow been changed physiologically by their experience of living with wild animals. So they've now got the heightened sense of hearing, the heightened sense of smell, the ability to see in the dark. And actually, according to Singh's reports, the girl's eyes would even glow in the dark like wolves. Yeah, I'm sure that's true. I'm absolutely 100% certain that their eyes would flash because they have somehow evolved to see in the dark in, what, the space of a year. Yeah, that's how evolution works. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, Amala would die in 1921 of a kidney infection, and Kamala would die eight years later of tuberculosis. Not a lot of happy endings in these stories. No, unfortunately, and, and it's only going to get worse, because unfortunately, it appears that all these claims were false. <gasps> Jacques! Quel surprise. So... Singh's diary was found to have not been a contemporary account of the girl's story, but rather fabricated in 1935, years after the girl's deaths. Pictures of the girls eating raw meat were found to have been taken in 1937, again, years after the fact. A medical doctor at the orphanage found no signs of long teeth, quadrupedal movement, night vision, etc. The only testimony at the time of the girl's feral nature was from Singh himself, but other accounts later brought to light said that he would often beat Kamala. Furthermore, Singh was later paid $500 for his accounts by an American anthropologist. This was later used in his book, Wolf Children and Feral Man. The book attracted the ire of his fellow academics, and he was quickly dismissed from his post at the University of Denver. Now, if you're shouting, Casper Hauser, when will these morons talk about Casper Hauser at your phone? Please don't. First, it will upset other people on the bus, and second, we'll be talking about that cheeky little scamp in part two. Ooh, something to look forward to. Yes. So, um, what do you think of the Kamala and Amala story? I mean, it seems to me like these were children who were just taken advantage of. Um which unfortunately is the case with a lot of these feral children's stories. It's possible that they were found in a wolf den, in which case they probably crawled in there for, like, to get out of the elements and for warmth. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't mean that they were raised by wolves. And who knows, like, when, when they escaped, like, when they were in the wild, you know? It could have been a week. It could have been a day. You know, we don't really know who these children were. Yeah. And although wolves are not inherently uh, predatory animals, i.e. they won't necessarily actively seek out humans in order to eat humans, they're also not the cuddliest animals, shall we say? Uh, so there's, for this to be true, there are outliers within outliers within outliers. So these children have to have survived their time being abandoned and then crawled into a wolf's den, presumably with a wolf mother who is in the process of nursing wolf cubs because that seems to be like when animals go through that hormonal cycle where they would be open to raising and nurturing any creature. Yeah, I mean, sure, we've all seen the pictures of like the dog nursing kittens or like a chicken sitting on top of like some other baby animal. Or, yeah, and you know. they are adorable. No one's disputing that they are adorable. They are so cute. I don't know why I'm so angry. I don't know either. You need to really, your blood pressure is going to go through the roof. I need to dial it back. I'm a 10 on the Palmer scale right now. Um, but yeah, but let's be honest. Most chickens aren't adopting people um, unless you've read Terry Pratchett, in, the, in which case there's the duck man. Cuckoo, cuckoo. Mm. Um, yeah, so it, it just seems to be, again, that they've taken little tidbits from other feral children's story and then weave them into something new. Yeah, and it's really sad because we think about all these children who were possibly just, like, lost for a short period of time or abandoned into the wild and never get, like, the help or love that they need. 
Yeah, and then people have tried to capitalize on that by adding a sexy animal spin to it. Yeah. Yeah. So, that's been part one of Feral Children. And yes, we know there are loads of other cases of children being quote-unquote raised by animals or being lost in the woods. I mean, we try to use Wikipedia as like a starting off point, um, but if you do go to like the wiki, there is like a ton of other cases. Unfortunately, we only have so much time to actually delve deep into these cases to figure out for you, like, not only the facts of the story and what happened to these children and what's the background, but also, like, is it true and what are the, re like, the sources that we have? We're not just, like, Googling and picking out, like, the first thing that comes up. We're trying to find reputable sources. Yeah. Uh, it is an extensive wiki as well. You can even find stories of feral children organized by animal parent mm. yeah so the the one dedicated to wolves and, and bears i think is quite expansive yeah i think people like i mean wolves are a pack animal right so we typically think of like wolves and they're close to dogs so you know mm. of course people raised by wolves and of course there's the whole romulus and remus thing she bears though i don't i don't think i'd want to take the chance with a, a mom bear and her cubs a like, she bear will fuck you up that's one of the first things that you learn in the pacific northwest like when you're growing up is like if you see cubs run you yeah <laughs> like the mom's around and she will murder you if you see cubs you will be tempted to take out your phone take a bunch of pictures find the right filter can i take a selfie with me and the cubs could i roll around amongst the cubs and have them cuddle me but you know, by the time you've even thought about that, the, the mom is already ripping your spine out through your back. Mm. So, yeah. Um, so, if you see a cub, run. I mean, don't run for all, anyway, yeah. for all bears, but, you know. Yeah. As and the you, situation demands. Yeah, sometimes <laughs> climb a tree, sometimes play dead, sometimes it's a polar bear, so just, like, You're screwed. pray to your god. <laughs> um, yeah. Right, so shall we end with a, a weird fact? Yeah, let's get weird. So, uh... My weird fact, we're going back to the story of Peter the Wild Boy and talking a little bit about King George I. Uh, yeah, a little bit of a scandalous guy. So King, <gasps> King George I, whom Peter the Wild Boy was initially gifted to, married his first cousin. As the royals are wont to do. As is the royal weight. Uh, her name was Sophia Dorothea of Chell, and this allowed him to secure a larger income. The couple had two children together and both had separate lovers. He had a mistress and Sophia had a romance with a Swedish count. <laughs> yeah? You'd think that that would be pretty chill. Like, if you've both taken separate lovers, you've got some kind of, like, polyamorous agreement going mm -hmm. on. Well, mm -hmm. yeah, well, she's a woman, so it's probably not going to turn out well for her. Uh, let's see how this goes. So, the Swedish count was later killed, some believe with George's connivance. The marriage was later dissolved on the grounds that Sophia had, quote, abandoned her husband. She was imprisoned inside her house in Chell for the next 30 years until her death. George had his mistress act as his royal host for the rest of his reign. Shocked! I'm shocked! Yeah. The woman took all the blame? Uh, strange but true. Hmm. Mm. Um, my weird fact, uh, was at the last minute. So, um, it's just that fervent monkeys have blue testicles. Why? <laughs> it's a sexual, like, uh, trait in order to, like, for selection. They, the bluer, the bigger the testicles, the uh, more attractive you are. The bluer the balls, the bluer the jizz. That's not scientifically accurate. Yeah. It, uh, fun picture, I guess. I sure, yeah. <laughs> um, a lot of monkeys apparently have, or primates. I'm not sure if vervet mon vervets are monkeys or primates, but uh, a lot of them have blue testicles. I'm sorry, I, I I missed a really obvious. Just give me give me the give me the fact again. Give me it one more time. Vervet monkeys have blue testicles. Is it because they they're not masturbating? <laughs> Talk about having blue balls. Am I right, fellas? Wah, wah. Yeah, so I uh, was looking up 
John Sabonia and like Vervin monkeys. So I was like, oh, you know, what do vervet monkeys look look like? And one of the first photos that comes up is like a monkey with like his big old blue testicles and a like a red penis. <laughs> I was like, right, well, that's my fact settled. <laughs> the monkey just cradling his blue balls, and he's like, when? When? Okay. All right, guys. On that note, we hope that you've enjoyed today's episode. Thank you so much for listening. If you like the show, please give us a like, give us a follow, and leave a review. This has been Enter the Rabbit Hole, as always, reminding you to not abandon children. Yeah, don't don't do it. Not cool. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, and if, and if you see a child running with a, a pack of feral dogs, maybe report it. Yeah, or at least tell a friend. Hmm. All right, guys. Take care for now. Ciao. Bye. Enter the Rabbit Hole is written and presented by William Grant and Alicia Palmer. The music was created by Glenn Marshall. More information and sources can be found in the episode description. You can email us at etrhthepod at gmail or follow us on Instagram at etrhthepod. Thanks for listening.